Have you heard of the big blow up? The year was 1910. And just five years before, the United States Forest Service had been established to care for the newly created national forests. And managing these national forests, they assumed, would require preventing forest fires. Well, what good is it to have national forests if you don't stop them from burning down? But in that, that big blow up of 1910, fires raged across Montana and Idaho and Washington. In just two days, three million acres burned. The officials of the, of the United States Forest Service were convinced and proceeded then to convince the country that with more resources, they could have prevented these fires. And so for the next several decades, that's just what we did. Resources poured into the effort to prevent every fire possible. And the campaign to educate the public about fire prevention with the goal of really completely eradicating fire from the wild landscape resulted in a beloved spokesperson, Smokey the Bear. <laughs> And it resulted in, in a change in the way that Americans saw fire, the way that the world approached fire management as many other nations adopted our, our fire suppression model. But the truth is, of course, as the ecologists studied and explained in the 1960s and 70s, fire is an integral and necessary part of a healthy forest ecosystem. Allowing some fires to burn supports the long-term health of the forest, and we've been working on updating and practicing that in the decades since. I learned this story from an organizational consultant, uh, Roger Schwartz, from his book on leadership in conflict. He said, standing in the fire is the name of it. He said, a common misconception is that we need to keep the peace in our institutions by suppressing anything that is controversial, loud, emotional, or politically polarizing. Anything that might spark a conflict is discouraged. But, he says, attempts to prevent or suppress uncertainty, conflict, and emotion produce what fire experts call a fuel buildup. Yeah a condition that contributes to large, highly destructive fires. It makes so much sense to try and keep the fires away. Fires are hot and dangerous and scary. You can get out of control quickly. I think probably most of us live most of our lives, most of the time, trying to have as few fires as possible. I know there are some exceptions. <laughs> I, uh, I noticed the other day, as I was going to put the pizza in, we had a, a friend sleeping over, a friend of Henry's for the weekend, and so I, I, I was putting in an extra pizza, and I needed to use both racks, and I noticed just as I was putting them in that that lower rack was too low but I didn't do anything. I just put the lower pizza right there, because it was just, I was, you know, in doing what I was doing. I didn't want to be bothered to pull it out and put it up a rung or two. And it burned. So I, I, what I'm wondering about is what it takes, what it takes to take that moment to figure out, are we too close to the fire or not close enough? Have you ever watched a glass blower at work? And they bring the glass, that, that molten glass, up to 2,400 degrees. 
2,400 degree furnace. And once those raw materials have settled into the glass, they, they bring down the temperature just down to 2,000 degrees. And then she pulls it out to let it cool. But if you let it cool too much, it'll shatter, so she has to bring it back in, bringing it out and in, out and in, carefully managing just how hot or how cool the piece is as she blows and spins and forms and shapes. I think this is a perfect metaphor for, for what we call spiritual practice, for the things that we do to try and bring ourselves awake and alive and alert to what the current moment holds for us. And I, I think that most of us probably could use a little more practice turning the oven up. I certainly could. Because there's, there's no transformation without the fire. I've never been tear gassed. I'm really grateful for those of you who, who have been. <laughs> but I was arrested once. I was arrested once at uh, Occupy Oakland. And it was uh, late in the night. And we, we had gathered through the night. We knew they had advertised the, the Oakland Police Department that this was the night they were going to finally, after weeks and months, of holding a stand there and, of course, in, in public places across the country for a new way, for economic justice, for another way forward. That night, they were going to dismantle the camp. They were going to kick everybody out. And, and, of course, at that point, there were many folks who had no homes who had made this their home. And so those of us who had gathered around the, uh, the interfaith tent, the interfaith prayer tent, we decided we would hold vigil that night, one of those spiritual practices, holding vigil. And we, we stayed up all night. And of course, they waited until as, as late as possible. It was just before dawn, because they wanted to have as, as little resistance, as few people around as possible. And, and there were a dozen of us sitting there at the interfaith prayer tent, but the images, all the images on the newspaper covers the next morning were of a, a guy I got to know named Pancho, Pancho Ramos, who was sitting in the middle of the plaza in just he, the perfect lighting for this shot, meditating with his feet tucked into lotus position, a beatific smile on his face and all the police officers in their riot gear trying to figure out how to arrest and take away <laughs> this smiling, happy Buddha of a man. What, what gives us the capacity to face danger, to face risk with that sort of equanimity? Later on, we, we were in jail all day together, and. I, I was uncomfortable. I was first time in jail. I was in my early 20s and, and nervous and uncertain. Pancho, however, was calm and relaxed and silent because it was a Monday and Pancho was silent on Mondays. <laughs> so he was silent and calm and relaxed in the jail. By the end of the day, after we'd been there for several hours. Everyone else had, had been released. It was just me and Pancho left, and I was starting to get nervous that you know, maybe something really bad was going to happen to me. Maybe they were going to make an example of me or something. And I, I, was, I was afraid. I was afraid, and I was looking to this silent, smiling Buddha with me in the jail cell for some reassurance. And I, I said, you know, am I, are we going to be OK? Are they going to let us go too? And he, he pointed to me. And he gave a little sign of, yeah, you're going to be free. And he pointed to himself, and he shrugged and put out his hands. And I didn't know then. I learned later that he was undocumented. He had 
come to study astrophysics. He was a brilliant man. He is a brilliant man. He, he was uh, studying astrophysics at UC Berkeley and had decided to stop cooperating because of the nuclear weapons projects that were happening at Lawrence Livermore Labs. And so was here now illegally. And a major community battle ensued. He was eventually released. The stakes were so much higher for him. And yet he was silent and happy and content the entire time. What gives us that capacity? What makes us able to face the fire with such clarity of heart and purpose? We've been talking about these roles, these offices of shared ministry. We've talked about the artist, and we've talked about uh, the theologian, the preacher. We talked last week about one more <laughs> I can't think of now. I always lose one. <laughs> There's eight of them, and I, every time I try and get them all, I always lose one. The prophet. We talked about the prophet and the theologian, the preacher and the artist. I want to delve a little bit into the counselor and the pastor this week. And some of you might already know yourselves, some of you I know are professional counselors, and at least a couple of you are professional pastors. But again, these are calls that reach many of us. These are invitations to offices of shared ministry that we can all practice. So. I remember early in my ministry when I uh, was called on as a counselor, feeling a, a pressure, whether it was in a hospital room or in someone's home or at a, a congregation, I, I felt a pressure to figure out just the right thing to say. You know that feeling? You're trying, someone's in distress and you're just trying to come up with the right thing to say. And I, I, I'd say some clever things but they were almost always about meeting my own needs. My need to be helpful or, or seen as wise or worthy of the role I was in. And these impulses in me, they still rise up, but I, I have something else that I practice now. And, and the, the most succinct way to say it, you've heard me say this before, but it's Parker Palmer's no fixing, no saving, no advising, no setting each other straight. <laughs> and I swear, it's, it's as simple as that, but it's one of the hardest things that I practice. How to instead hold that quiet through the night vigil, that deeper listening, how to listen someone else into sharing their own deeper wisdom. I'm not a, a daily meditator. Sometimes I think I should be. Mostly I'm giving that up. But I, I am aware of the incredible gifts that the practice of meditation has given my life. And one of the simplest ones is that that breath is accessible in every moment. Every moment is an opportunity to notice, to become aware of the process of my breathing, which can get me in touch with that wiser, deeper self who's available to just be. Sometimes it's as simple spiritual practice as taking three deep breaths in a challenging moment. So these practices that make us available as counselors, counselors to one another, as deep listeners, they also can make us available as, as pastors. And I know that that's a tricky word for some people. But I do think there's something beautiful in this image of tending to your sheep, not you, the sheep inside you, <laughs> to tending to be the pastor for your own lost sheep, 
for your own fears and anxieties, for those old wounded parts, for the places in us that would rather not buck the cultural norms and take the risks and live the more courageous life into future possibilities, the parts of us that would rather stay small in the status quo. They, they need good tending. So it can be as simple as three deep breaths, and sometimes it can be simple as an anchor thought. I love Forest Church's anchor thought. Want what you have, do what you can, be who you are. Or Byron Katie, the spiritual teacher out here in California, she says, you know, wherever I go, whatever I'm doing, I'm just sitting down, standing up, or lying down. <laughs> There's, there is nothing else. <laughs> Just remembering one of those mantras, David White says, poetry is writing good advice to yourself. <laughs> hey, whatever, whatever these little anchor thoughts, it can be as simple as bringing one of them to mind. To remember my own capacity, your own capacity to be a good shepherd, to be a pastor to yourself, to those you're caring for and tending for. <clears throat> when you're really hooked, you might need a little bit more in that jail cell or with your, you know, Uncle Roger or whoever it is. And I found the unhooking mantra to be quite useful. I'm just sharing the practices scattershot. Here's what I try. I know many of you have practices. And if you don't, you probably do. And naming them, recognizing them as spiritual practices might be a useful step on the journey. Uncle Roger is getting to you. The unhooking mantra says, Uncle Roger is fine just as he is. I can try to understand why he does what he does, but I don't have to. I give him to God. I am fine letting him be fine just as he is. Sometimes you say it over and over again throughout the day <laughs> when someone has particularly got their hooks in you. There's a, a Buddhist story about how to face the fire that goes like this. The Buddha, after becoming enlightened, sitting under the, that Bodhi tree for seven days and seven nights, had, had, had gotten there, but he, he was really hungry because he'd just been sitting and not eating for so long. And so he was so close to the point of starvation, but he knew there was a, a rich man nearby who would give alms to those who asked. And so he, he went to his house to ask. And the rich man had heard someone was at his door, and so he sent a, a servant out to go fill the Buddha's bowl. But meanwhile, Mara, the, the Buddhist idea of the, the god of the fear of death, was watching. And Mara, we're told, he's filled with, with greed for power over all beings. But the only way that he gets this power is because of the fear of death. And, and Buddha was like his, 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 his golden prize. He wanted Buddha more than anyone else because Buddha seemed so unafraid, so, so immune to this fear that grips so many of us. And he wanted, therefore, to destroy him. And so he saw this moment where Buddha was close to starvation. He thought, this was my time. And so before the servant could come and place the food in Buddha's alms bowl, Mara caused a deep pit of red hot burning coals to appear between them. And the servant, of course, saw this and was frightened 
afraid of his own death, he ran back to his master and, and the rich man asked him why he had returned without giving the alms to the Buddha. And the servant said, there is a fiery hot coal of pits, pit, pit of coals, just in front of the Buddha. And, and the rich man thought, he's crazy. He must be seeing things. So he sent another servant. The story goes with alms food. And he, too, was frightened by the same pit of fiery coals. So the rich man himself comes, and he, he takes the alms food to the Buddha. And he sees the flames rising from the fiery pit. He looks up and he sees the terrible god of death floating above in the sky. And I think we all know this moment, this moment that the man faced then to flee and take care of his own life, to, to submit, to let the Buddha starve, to, to rebel and fight, to try and take on this ferocious and powerful God to extinguish the flames. This moment of the glass blower coming in and out, this moment of risk and danger where transformation and possibility is held in a redwood seed. What gave him the courage to step forward into the pit? There's many versions. Perhaps he took three deep breaths. Maybe he remembered who he really wanted to be as a role model for his children. Maybe he practiced a moment of loving kindness meditation and connected to his desire for happiness and peace for all beings. Maybe he was even able to extend that to Mara. <coughs> Perhaps he just asked himself what joy and justice looked like in this moment. How he might share his life's journey or celebrate the paths that he saw before him or act to make a difference. However he did it, that man found the strength to stand in the fire and choose a third way. And the story goes that as he stepped into the burning pit, he felt himself being lifted up by a cool lotus blossom. And the pollen from this miraculous flower spread into the air and covered him with the glowing color of gold. And while standing in the heart of the lotus, he himself poured the alms into the bowl of the Buddha. <coughs> When we got arrested that early morning, the police asked us, Are you, is this your plan to get arrested? You've been still sitting here all night. We've given the warnings. They really didn't want to arrest anyone. They warned three or four times. Kurt Kuwald was sitting next to me. He said, no, our plan is just to sit right here in the plaza. No, our, our plan is just to give this food to that man there. One last story, it was the story that inspired this final blessing, this poem of Jan Richardson's. It's the story of Elijah, when he was <laughs> swept up away at the end of his life, swept into a, a whirlwind right next to his pupil, his student, Elisha. Elisha picks up the mantle. And there's somehow this sense that the mantle has been blessed by this danger that Elijah has faced and given himself over to. She writes, make no mistake. This blessing that comes like hands laid upon your head, a mantle draped across your shoulders, you do not bear it alone. Think of it as a lineage, as litany. An ancient legacy entwining you among the strands that weave through generations and centuries, that spiral with the enduring and determined grace of the story that has seized you and the one who has claimed and called you. 
Take heart that this blessing comes to you singed and scorched. Signed by the blazing of wonders you can barely imagine. And by trials that have already tested you. Or you would not have found your way this far. Lay it down and it will be a path for you across terrain you never imagined daring to cross. Take it up and know the presence of those who have passed this on to you, who encompass you, who enfold you, who go with you and release you into the keeping of the road that is your own and the one who has called your name. May we all feel that blessing, that ordination, that call to counsel and to pastor our own tender sheep and whatever plot of land, whatever community we've been given to tend. May it be so. And amen.